And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from the land of things powered by Unox, and, cre and creator of the in-development post-post-apocalyptic SF RPG known as Shifting Tides, the one and only Isabel Hall. How are you doing today, man? I am I am quite well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Pleas pleasure to have you on. Um, now, a bit of a tradition around here is opening with the humble beginnings. Um... With that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick for you? Um, so, right at the start, um, I would generally go around my friend's house. Um, this was when I was probably about 14 or 15, mm -hmm. roughly. Um, and they actually first introduced me to, I believe it was, third edition. Um the indie third edition, I should say. Mm -hmm. And we had no idea what we were doing because we, we were like, we were still in school. Um, but thankfully, my friend's older brother uh, would play it quite a bit. And he had models and he had um, like, uh, um, like scenery. And um, he was actually pretty good at role playing uh, for the time. Um, and it was at that point, it was more of just kind of hanging out. Um, and as a, like as a teenager, uh, we weren't really taking it too seriously. Um, and, you know, our engine spans weren't the best. <laughs> so we kind of after a little bit, we kind of dropped it. Um, but I think it kind of I think for more more social aspects sort of stuck with me um, and after a few years, I kind of went back to role playing, um, not in the form of D and D, uh, but more in the form of like Shadowrun. Um, I can't remember what edition it was at the time, um, but I got really into like map making and making huge, like table spanning proper maps, and um, that was fun. I roped a few friends into that, um, mostly by offering food, but <laughs> I, I got them on board. Um, and then I found D&D 2nd Edition, AD&D. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's still with me. I still love playing that game. Um, most of the people are still on the fence. Um, but that's mainly about FACO. Um, and yeah, that's kind of where it was. Um, it was mostly, you know, not taking it too seriously, going around my friends for like four or five hours, um, you know, third edition, Shadowrun, that sort of stuff. Um, and I think that's kind of shaped how I, I make games now because, um, you know, for third edition, I love kind of, uh, for better or worse, for, kind of for OPness, that you can really do anything with it. Um, and then Jeez. Shadowrun came aboard. <laughs> You, lo and you, that love, was fun. you love you love cheesing the system. I I got it. <laughs> Fairy crafting is is my jam, really. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I know. I just just I'm le I'm legally required to to give everybody a hard time. <laughs> um, <laughs> of course, um, making broken builds is kind of uh, the name of a game for oh, those editions. So. You're you're probably familiar with the Legend of Pun Pun. Uh not that one. No. That was that was something that was something concocted by a madman on the old wizards forums to try and create oh, no. the most broken ass build possible oh, with a kobold who t who um because of his setup could because of and using a loophole with evoker could theoretically give himself infinite levels and infinite classes. <laughs> um, and of course there's the infamy that is Codzilla, um, cleric or druid. <laughs> Um, but when I, w when I was going, th when I was going through the, um, the playtest document, um, I came, I of course came across the inspirations list that you put in and 
there's there's some there there's an interesting little mix and i'd be and within these kind of inspirations i'd be cu i'm curious about what you what you took from what you took from each and what what kind of stood out to you um uh, sure um, is there any specific ones um or do you want me to just go down the list um or... i'm good i'm good i'm consider consider this a bit of a word association kind of thing so i'll 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 give I'll give you I'll give you a name either that you've mentioned or one that's on the list, and I'd like you to sure. um tell me what tell me what stood what stood out to you at with that particular entry, um sure. it's, it's not on the list but um I'd, since you mentioned it I'd like to start with Shadowrun, um given the t given the timeline I'm guessing that you started with either fourth or fifth edition. Uh, I'm, I'm probably fourth. It's, it rings a bell. Um, but in terms of like inspiration and kind of what I've taken from that, um, it was mostly, um, mostly sci-fi kind of a mix of how it com compared to like D and D, for example, it was a lot more grounded. Um, and I, I think that's kind of why I like for more post-apocalyptic settings rather than pure fantasy. Um, cause by definition, or I guess by definition, it post-apocalyptic is a lot more grounded, um, because it can't be really that outlandish. Um, obviously with the exceptions of, uh, stuff like, um, um, was it mutant year zero and stuff like that? Mm. Uh, you know, like some of the apocalypses, that sort of stuff is, um, they, they can be a bit more, you know, outlandish, but. Uh, in in general, I found they're they're, they're grounded, um, and that that allows me to um, kind of contrast it with the kind of techno magical aspect, um, or at least for shifting tides, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, I've had a I've had a, a few other games which were um, not apocalyptic, but. Uh, Kind of like um, uh, stars without number, where it's like it it's in that setting, but it isn't specifically you know everything's broken and stuff. Um, but I I love the grounded aspect, um, and then obviously you had for weapons and um, you know for rolling barrels of dice, <laughs> um, that kind of uh, that's fun, um, and I I feel like when I played it, I could kind of scale up for complexity. I didn't have to just start off with like like a bucket of dice. I could just be um like a, a rolling like maybe five dice at a time. That sort of stuff. Um and then for complexity is on me to it like expand it rather than of game forcing it to. Yeah. Um so ne the next one on next one on my list is um, mm -hmm. Pathfinder first and second respectively. Uh, sure. Uh, so for Pathfinder first edition, um, like as I said before, I love theory crafting. Mm -hmm. uh, 1E is perfect for that, um, and I think that's for me kind of uh, inspiration and takeaway for I've you know got from Pathfinder um, is a fact for like you could do any build that you want. So I'm always trying to kind of uh, incorporate new archetypes and uh, kind of aspects of gameplay that somebody might want. Like, nobody has to use everything in a book. Um, but if, it's, if they want to, it's there for them to use. Um, and because there's no class system, uh, or at least no rigid class system like fighter, you know, cleric, that sort of stuff, they could use anything they want. Um, I don't like the restrictions on it. Um, I understand classes, like in Pathfinder. Um, they do limit it, and it does boost creativity sometimes. Um, but I've gotten in the habit of just having game, my, at least for games I make, um, just let the player choose what they want to do rather than pigeonhole them. Um, and for Pathfinder 2nd Edition, um, I basically uh, 
copied for action economy <laughs> and, and battle like uh, uh, from at least for my one I got uh, a, a few actions and a triggered action mm -hmm. um, so players can mix and match what they want to do on their turn uh, instead of this is a move action or this is an attack action oh no you can't attack anymore so that sort of stuff um, it's up to the player I want to put for uh, control in the player's hands of what they want to do all right that may, that um that certainly that can certainly makes make sense um the um the next one that I, the next one that i wanted to at, that i wanted to ask on is um is star is starfinder sure. um starfinder i am currently in a campaign for starfinder um, and that's kind of mostly where my inspirations come from. Um, it's kind of alien aspects. Um, and I found that like, what, 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 once this game is done and in the inspiration section, if the inspirations aren't specifically like things I've taken mm. or um, it's more of aspects of a game that I kind of liked, or a theme, or a um, kind of a feeling I get from playing them. So for Starfinder, it is the, um, the ability that you could go to different planets, or um, there's different aliens that you can encounter. Like, I think I had a, a player uh, join my party that was, um, I can't remember the name of the species, but it was a giant like uh, silicon slug and it's like you don't find that in like uh like pathfinder well i mean i guess you technically could but you don't typically find that in fantasy games um and it's like it's so outlandish that it's like i want i kind of want to learn more i want to know for law of that mm -hmm. um and that's kind of a feeling that i want to emulate with this um because it's all about exploration um oh. and not very you're gonna find all right. Um, Stars Without Number. Um, I just love the game. I love how um, hard it is at certain points. Um, it doesn't really pull any punches. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of got that old school vibe that I, I'm trying to emulate, but I'm not entirely sure if I've got that down correctly. Um, but... Yeah, I, I for psionics is a, is a big one as well. Um, you know, having psychic characters is always a boost for a party. Um, but of course, as I said before, like you're being pigeonholed into that. Um, you're you're weak to most things if you're if you use like psionics. So um, I wanted to kind of incorporate that aspect um, and the fact that they're pretty OP once you get like to the end game. Mm. Um, and like a sh a shot from a rifle is still going to probably down you, even if you're like max level. It's gonna hurt, but you're gonna go down uh, with a well play shot. Um, Numenera. Uh, for weird and wacky is what I got from that, <laughs> um, as well as the um, kind of quote unquote kind of like artifact system and like. Um, items that you can get and they have like dual purposes or uh, misunderstood technology um, plus the fact that it's so far removed from where we are now in, in like in real life um, that it's got all of the past civilization stuff in it um, and in my one that past civilization not many people are still alive from that era um, so they don't really know what certain things do. Um, like Numenera, AI, it's magical, basically. <laughs> Nobody knows what, what it does. Um, and that's kind of the same in mine. Um, so I kind of wanted for weird, really. It's interesting you bring that, that kind of thing up, since I've often said that the, that the, big, the, big, theme of, the big theme about whether or not Numenera is science fiction or fantasy is is um flip is um yes because yeah. because it's because 
the line the line between the two in that setup is so bl is so blurry it's taking Clark's law to such an extreme that tr that trying to trying to figure out where it w where it falls into that is pointless um i'd say yeah I'd say, i totally uh, agree um now speaking since you mentioned old, since you mentioned old school um next one on my list is ad and d and um I'll get I'll get this out of the way first. When it comes to this, are you referring to AD and D first or second edition? Um, I believe I played second edition. All right. Um, it's one of it's one of those thing it's one of those things that I have to have to clarify because there are some very mm -hmm. significant differences between those two, and much in the same way as if you said if you said if you said original D and D, then I'd have to ask you which version because there's like five yeah. of them. <laughs> Yeah, no, I uh, I understand that. It's um f for what I've got from that, um, it's mainly kind of the toughness and um, past versions of my game were uh, quite a bit harder. Um, there weren't as many uh, like damage mitigating abilities or um, ways to kind of evade attacks. Um, so that's, I guess, in a way, like I've been, I, I've become a bit more lenient on on the players. Um, but I I still want it to be tough, tough but fair, is kind of how I want the game to go. Um, if if players plan, um, they can get through anything if if they're smart enough. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel. Like when I was playing it, because I, I played second uh, second edition um, just before uh, uni in college, and then throughout uni as well, and I that's exactly how I felt when I was playing the game. It was tough but fair, and if you go in, rush in to like a, a situation, you're just going to get slapped. Mm. Um, and yeah, that's exactly how I want it to be. That's exactly what I got from it, basically. Yeah. Um. Pillars of Eternity. Uh, just a great game. <laughs> great pair of games, to be honest. Uh, it's more two than one. Uh, more of the asp uh, exploration aspects. Um, and me kind of taking some of the, some of, like, the spells uh, for Arena, because they were great spells. Mm -hmm. um, and some of, I, I believe I did some of the dialogue um, as well. Um, I wanted to have more emphasis on a for exploration, but also kind of like talking to NPCs and like um, different factions as well. Mm -hmm. um, you'd probably you'd probably get a kick out of tyranny if you haven't if you haven't done that. Even though that is in the fan it is technically in the fantasy end of things, but yeah. not in the traditional I approach. Yes, I, uh, I I've I've played that. Oh, oh, a, a while ago, um, but I, I haven't really given it a chance, like properly. Um, I I got a little bit into it, and I was like, yeah. I I had other stuff playing, so yeah. Um, <laughs> Path of Exile. Uh, gems, um, <laughs> build, builds and spells mostly. Mm -hmm. um, you can do crazy builds. You can. Um, make is mainly for crafting actually as well um a big obviously i i'm, I'm sure you might know i don't know if you played it oh um, i have perfect then then you'll understand entirely for it's just crafting mm -hmm. um and i was using that as actually as a base for mine um having like prefixes suffixes uh using currency as crafting material um, because post-apocalypse, resources are scarce. Um, what do you trade with? Surely you don't use actual currency because that's pretty much worthless now. So you use stuff that's usable, um, just like the bartering system like we used to use. So that's kind of how I wanted to go. Um, and then, unfortunately, my game is not a PC game, so it can so you can't use, uh, like really like realistically realistically i should say you can't use 
random generation that much. Um, it's fine for like for GM um, if you're you know making maps or making you know areas, but putting that on a player, I feel was too much. Um, it wasted a lot of time that could have been used um, elsewhere, really. Um, but I, I think I've still got some of that in there, mainly with the um, formatological processes with like adding stuff to weapons. Um, also, I've taken a lot of the wording from Path of Exile um, and kind of condensed that down in mine. Um, so things are like straightforward. There's no like double meaning to stuff. Um, like abilities, you just, you get them, you know what they do. You can't really mistake them for anything else. Um, but yeah, I, it's one of my top uh, inspirations. And um, I don't know, kind of, uh, like, I don't know if we're going to kind of get onto other stuff today, but um, I've kind of taken the whole uh, expansion model, quote unquote, and I'm going to use it for my game. So once I finish this, uh, at least for base, for core book, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to start doing it in three or four month chunks and adding expansions like that, uh, at least try to, um, and then add to the world, add more lore, you know, abilities, etc. Mm -hmm. Cause I think it's a fantastic model and, um, Obviously, I won't get as much done as, uh, say, GGG, but, um, you know, I it's something to look forward to. All right. Um, the laundry, and I'm I'm assume I'm assuming. Now, uh, when 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 it comes to the laundry on this, are you referring to the RPG or are you referring to the book series? Um, mainly for RPG. Um, I started reading the book series, or listening to, I should say, um, but I haven't got that far through it. Um, at least for the RPG, um, I love like the uh, dry, uh, sarcastic humor at times. Mm -hmm. um, for bureaucracy, is great, um, and just how grounded it was. Um, some of the sci, well minor sci-fi ele elements um and kind of the lovecraftian aspect is uh, is a big um inspiration of mine um i i love um the lovecraft mythos uh as a whole it's it's um it's kind of been a big theme throughout majority of my games mm -hmm. um battle tech um, at the time when I added that in, I was having uh, robotic suits and like exoskeletons. Um, they will probably be in there still, but they need a huge rework. But it was literally like, uh, you know, for suits from Anthem. Yeah. Um, probably, uh, probably. It was the, like that. Probably the. So, no, um,. So I'm guess I'm guessing you I'm guessing the one of the big takeaways was for you was the um was the power suits used by elementals dirty clanners. <laughs> um, <laughs> I I think I I can't really remember um like the game that much. Mm -hmm. Um, sorry my me my memory is pretty short. Um, but. It, I I love the idea of just like wielding a like a big big ass suit and really going to town. Um, it, in one of my past games, I had them in, and at the end, once you start getting those uh, and you start getting to the end game, it turned more into Warhammer. Mm -hmm. um, so you'd have actual troops and then do stuff with those troops, and then you go back to like tabletop RPG sort of uh, stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to import that into Shifting Tides. Yeah. Um, but obviously it needed a big change because of the battle system and um, how everything was structured. Mm -hmm. um, but look forward to those because they will be in there at some point. Yeah. Um, Rainbow Six Siege. Destruction. 
um, the big aspect of it, um, just uh, going into like an area, planning, and then just blowing everything up. Or, well, you would hope uh, they wouldn't blow up the target, but blowing everything up, sieging specific uh, areas, mm -hmm. um, but mostly for planning aspect. It was a big um, kind of like, you do this, you do that. Um, I have stuff for like uh, readying actions for when something else goes off. So uh, players could throw a flashbang through a window and then um, another player could ready uh, an action to burst through the door once that's done and another one could do it. Like, oh, an enemy's been alerted. Hmm. I've readied my action to attack when they've done that. Uh, like they get alerted, I attack. Um, so kind of setting up chain combos and sieging an area. Um, that was a whole kind of thing for me. And accidentally killing the hostage if you're playing Fuse. Of course, that as <laughs> as is tradition. <laughs> that that and that and um, wishing death on whoever on whoever's whoever's playing um, Kavera. Ah, of course. Um, Absolutely toxic character, but yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, and I'm totally not saying that because I, because I because I prefer because I prefer more beefy more beefy characters. I've never been good at the whole three speeders. Um, oh yeah, and any time I play them, I get one tapped, and it's like there's no point in me playing them. Yeah, um, but um, XCOM two, i.e., i.e., RNG bullshit. Ninety five percent chance to hit. You never hit. <laughs> um, that's not how statistics works, guys. Please stop. Um, but uh, Overwatch sort of uh, style, um, readying actions again, uh, much like Siege. Um, it's kind of like having for different loadouts um, and having. Um... Oh, I didn't add a few games onto that. My bad. Um, but yeah, sorry. Um, Having loadouts, having specific um, like weapons for specific enemies, mm -hmm. um, that was a big thing for me. Um, for energy weapons as well, um, while not really prevalent here, it's been a quite a big inspiration for you know a few of my other stuff as well. Yeah. Um, but mostly that. Did you ever try suffering through the long war mod? Uh, in number one, I did. Um, that was hell. Uh, number two. I'm I'm gonna have a, a hot take here, and I think number one is better than number two. Um, I um, I ha I I kind of I kind of I kind of grab it. I kind of flip flop e either either way. I can, uh, when it comes to those two, but I would sooner play both of them than play Chimera Squad. I've never played that one. I've heard mixed feelings for that. Um. Chimera, Chimera Squad felt way felt way too much like XCOM trying to be Borderlands, and that just mm -hmm. left a really bad. It was it was way too comic booky, and it just, okay. and that just left a really bad taste in my mouth. What well, rather comedic sort of thing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and while the and the if it wanted to do that as as a a side story or a or a spin off you you know like how battlefield bad company is is a more is a more humorous take on on mm. its on its genre i yeah. think i i think i would have been a little bit more okay with it but um be, but being a but being a sequel has certain expectations yeah you don't really change for genre once it's been established that far um, is that the one with the snake boobs? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah I was thinking of a right game. That's all I know. It's um. <laughs> really. It's that's quite that's quite a damning statement when that's when that's the main the main thing that sticks out to you about it. Yeah, it um kind of flew under the radar for me, except for uh, for aforementioned aspects. Yeah. Now. Um, now you've described shifting tides as a post post apocalypse. Um, yes. Now that's a genre that is that is no stranger to it to having a presence here in the temple. 
Um, a recent example being Fragged Empire. But how? But how do you how do you define what a post post apocalypse means? So my my understanding is, and this will probably not be like many other people's, but it is mine, and I will stick to it. Um, it's a uh, post apocalypse that is just getting back into relative normality. So you have so there's post apocalypse where it's everything's destroyed, mm -hmm. or at least you know very barely, um, just about finished being destroyed, um, and then you have the world just getting back. Um, like just opening up trade, um, very medieval. Um, that's kind of what I was going for. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that it's basically a new civilization at this point. Um, most of the stuff from the old world is either unrecognizable to current inhabitants or um, they're scared of it. Because AI, robots, um, so, uh, uh, monsters, which weren't there before. Um, that's not to say, like, for before times, so to speak, were not dangerous. Um, it's just that it was an advanced c civilization. Um, and nobody from that is, well, 99.999% of the for people there are gone. Um, so... It's a completely new society, really, um, with no expectations from the past. Now, th given 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 all of that, mm -hmm. um, when it came now, give now um, as I as I understand it, the se the setup that you the setup that you have with um, with char with character creation is. Sure. In, is intentionally going is intentionally going to be freeform. You don't really have you don't really have a class setup. You don't really have a archetype um, setup. Um, how? But oftentimes that particular approach can come with the cost of the potential of analysis paralysis. Um, how do you how do you mitigate that particular issue? Um. I'll answer that with a kind of a, a, a question, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. What part of the character creation process would you say is the most likely to cause that paralysis? Um, that's a, that's a that's a bit tricky because a lot of times it a lot of times it's it's not caused by one thing per se, but more mm -hmm. how th but more how things are implemented. A a okay. very common culprit, especially in the especially in the Early to mid two thousands, in my in my opinion, it was the was the ha was the habit of of here's your here's your attributes and skills here's a here's a here's a but here's a bunch of points to spend on all of it now swim damn it um, okay I see I see so like um kind of further edition giving you like fifty points to put on skills actually or... actually one of the one I'll of the it. big one of the um big culprits for me. Was, sh was shadow was um shadow run, um mm -hmm, for, yeah. up until up until fi up until fifth edition, and even and even that even then it this is debatable on it and the and the big reason why is the metric assload of skills in the book. Skills yeah. skill gr skills skill groups. Sub subtypes of subtypes of skills. There's there's just way 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 too many skills, and a lot and way too many of them are ve are very specific. Um, of course, there's all there's also the fact that Shadow that Shadowrun claim a game like Shadowrun claims to be a free claims to be free form and classless, but in practice it really isn't because people are still going to be playing to certain archetypes. Yeah, they um they'll gravitate towards uh, what works best for them, and kind of they know that, so they won't really choose anything else. 
Well, um, what I what I mean by what I mean by that is ultimately ultimately somebody's going to pitch that they're playing Street Sam or they're pl or they're playing Mage or they're or they're playing Decker sl slash Hacker and nobody's playing Technomancer mm -hmm. because nobody cares about Technomancers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but that that's kind that's kind of what I mean when I say Shadowrun is a classless system that thinks it isn't. Okay. Yeah. No. I I get what you mean. Um. <sighs> In, in terms of the original question, um, I have kind of set up the game. Oh, I've gone through many iterations, but I've tried to set up the game to be. Um, it, it's not so much. I say I say classless. Um, obviously, people are going to play like I'm a mage or I'm a warrior. Like, that's just how people play. Like, I can't stop that. Um, and I don't really want to um, because I, I know for, like, if, if somebody's always been playing a healer because they like healing and they don't really like, uh, you know, having to calculate, like, dice rolls or uh, get into it and then, like, die, um, that's fine. Like, more power to them. And that's what they want to do. Um, I... For, uh, I've I've limited the number of skills to just what needs to be in the game. Um, I believe I have roughly about thirty skills, um, but they all play a purpose. Um, players um, at level up, obviously, they can choose what they want to put on um, because. You know, it's it's a skill system. They're allowed to choose what they want, um, but for most, for things that I, I'm not sure I've seen before, but I probably there probably is, um, is a fact that you can use any skill with any attri attribute um, that you want. Obviously, if it makes sense, if it doesn't make sense, then the GM will probably say, "Well, no," um, but you can try. Um, uh, I put the rule in a book for as long as it is justifiable, you can use it. Um, so you might use, um, if you're trying to heal somebody of like a, uh, sword wound through the arm, you could use your healing with your strength because, well, I, I'm strong. I know about muscles because I train them. Um, let's try and patch up this, this, uh, muscle wound. Um, it, if it's justifiable, you can use it. Um, so I think that kind of stops people from trying to pigeonhole themselves, um, a little bit at least, um, in terms of actually being classless, classless, mm -hmm. um, there are, I guess, pseudo classes, um, their core abilities, which kind of define your character, um, but only in so much that they're not like, oh, I'm a fighter. I have to use like swords. Uh, I have to um, be on the front line, for example. Um, if I scroll down, because I can specifically do them. Um, for example, um, there we go. Um, so you can use um, like explosive rebirth. Um, that doesn't specifically pigeonhole you into like a mage or a fighter or a uh, cleric, um, but it's still useful for. Um, anyone that wants to use it. Um, same for like extreme mimicry. Mm -hmm. um, that just lets them be kind of a jack of all trades because you can swap out like your core abilities and then get like give them to other people sort of thing. Um, at, obviously a lesser um, power. Um, and the fact that you can change your abilities at, at, over time um, because it's the same as Path of Exile, basically. Mm. 
um, your abilities come on crystals um, that you slot kind of into yourself. Um, and instead of like just sticking with, oh, I've got a an ability which lets me dash, I can just go, I don't want that anymore. I want to use something else. Um, and you can have different builds, essentially. Um, I'm not sure if I've put it enough emphasis on that. Um, I would hope that it comes across. Um, but that's mainly the gist of it. Um, and I don't know if I've rambled. <laughs> um, oh. it's, it's, it's sort of hard to explain without really playing it because it's, there's a load of features which play with each other. Yeah. Um, and I haven't specifically like kind of tried to push any players to go here or to go there. Um, I've left it really open. Uh, I, well, at least I hope I have. Um, and yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry if that didn't make any sense, but yeah. Um. When I look when I look at character when I look at character creation, one of the other things I'm cu I'm curious about is when I see the when I see the co when I see the core abilities is that is that is that where a bit of the um a bit of the cipher system slash Numenera um influence is because I'm very much reminded of the focus part of the character creation trinity in um, Numenera with that. A little bit, yes. Um. That you are this, and you do this, basically. Um, over time, I might do it so that you can swap those out. Um, but I think it would be at, at a cost, like an opportunity cost, um, rather than you just being able to do it like for common abilities. Um, because those are your, not your defining like abilities, because you don't have to use your core core abilities to, you know, be a hero or to be an adventurer. Um, they just kind of they're something that your character can do. They don't define you, so to speak. Um, but for now, you're kind of stuck with them if you choose one. Yeah. Um, and I've tried to make it so that those core abilities kind of work with. Um, a lot of the common abilities that you can find because mm -hmm. um, there's nothing worse than kind of having a build and then finding out for like 90% of like skill gems or um, abilities or feats to just don't work with your stuff and it's like that sounds really cool if only I could use it or like um, the struggle I, of I figured every out Diablo. a way to do something the struggle so. of every Diablo player ever this yeah. would be a really this would be a really awesome weapon if it weren't if it weren't for a completely different class. Yeah, it's um, it's like I c I could do so much with this. Like I could fairy craft or um, like you're playing like D and D and you get a specific like um, you you see a specific skill and it's like I could I could use this in like my lore and like. Yeah, maybe my family is comes from um, a bunch of monks that know this style, um, but I can't use it because, well, it just doesn't work for me. Um, or I've specced into a spear and like this sword thing looks cool, but can't use it because I got a spear. Um, I've I've tried to make it so things work with each other a lot more. And give. Given that, given that, and I can I can definitely see that with the whole um, the whole ability crystal setup that you have, um, mm. what whenever whenever when a question that I often end up having to ask um, reg in regard to in regard to games that are that are on the SF end of the spectrum, which means that there's going to be a lot more viable um, melee weapons and a lot more viable ranged weaponry, is how how do you make sh how do you make sure that you don't have a Shadowrun's return situation where guns are better than everything? Um, first off, I don't have guns because they were they are hell to balance. <laughs> um, but in for, in the general tone of a question, how do I yeah how do I make sure something isn't just like meta? Um, 
first, I would generally make it so that like some things are always going to be better than others. Like that is just how it goes uh, in in almost anything. Um, I'm not trying to stop something being better than others. Um, and clearly, if it is, if it's really cool, like uh, like n n tier spells are always going to be better than like tier one spells. Like mm -hmm. yeah, um, but I want them to have an opportunity cost to being used. Um, so like for example, um, you could uh, go dual wielding. That is a very viable like kind of quote unquote build. Um, it's pretty. It's so, like it's surprisingly good with like evasion and like just dodging and then like just getting like that extra attack, uh, that extra attack power, especially if you're like using all all three of your like um, actions per turn to attack. That's like a bunch of damage, but you lose your defense. You lose defense from shields. You um, don't do like overall. You don't do as much damage as if you were like using it like a sledgehammer um because they do just hit harder um and the fact that like you can't quickly use an item from your armor um you have to specifically stop and like kind of uh, holster your weapon to use something mm -hmm. um so while it may something may seem like really good and it's like why would i use anything else i mean you you can you can use that but just think about kind of what you're giving up. Um, and it's like, because you can, you can swap out your abilities or you can swap out like your crystals. Um, you don't have to just like play that one build. Cause I'm sure like some people really like just having a, a OP builds and just playing that forever. But for me, that's boring. I like changing and, you know, doing different um, ideas um, it's even better if I don't have to kill a character to do it um, um, but yeah <laughs> that's generally it uh, I want a cost to everything um, and for more powerful it is for more more cost there is essentially mm -hmm. um, be that in the ter in terms of like not being attack not being able to attack as much not being able to do other actions um, not being able to defend uh that sort of thing oh all right, all right. i can cert <laughs> i can certainly get that um and in, and give now this brings me to, this brings me to to another issue another issue that can happen with balancing as as somebody who's um cut, who's cut their teeth in the in d and 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 pathfinder 2 to a, to a certain extent, um, I'm sure, sure you're. I'm sure you're. From, I'm sure you're aware of the um, magic user, non-magic user divide that can happen. Yes, martial um, versus casters. Yes. Um. How how have you how have you made? Um. Obvious. Obviously, there has to be some degree of power when it comes to psionics. But what steps have you made to yeah. make sure that that um psionics doesn't get so powerful that it's dipping into other people's turf uh yeah so when i'll, I'll tell you for uh, kind of a scenario if i will explain mm -hmm. that um basically let's say you've uh you're like uh you're tier three you've got a bunch of um you've got a bunch of fp now mana um you got a few spell crystals for you use regularly. You like them; they're pretty cool. Mm. Um, but you you find something that's like uh, oh, it does area of effect, chaos damage, which typically bypasses resistances. Um, but it uses a bunch of like a load of FP per turn uh, or per cast, I should say. Um, and oh, what's this? Oh, you spell description. Oh, it reserves a bunch of FP as well. Oh, wait. So you have to reserve mana, so your max mana is reduced, and you still have to spend mana as well. It's like, ah, uh, do I do I really want to use this when I have like a bunch of lower level stuff that I can 
like kind of burst fire out as well um and it's like that's kind of the balance that i want to go for um using magic is powerful don't get me wrong um most of the time it is area effect stuff it's uh it's not really direct damage mm -hmm. um it's kind of like slowing enemies uh giving debuffs um that's the sort of stuff that i really like i i don't like playing like oh i'm just gonna use magic missile and just attack one person like every round that's that's boring like i want to cast firestorms and like destroy like buildings and you know that sort of stuff mm. um so but i i'm balancing by having them be costly um at the start they're not that bad really um since they're kind of uh, buffs and debuffs to allies and enemies. Um, and kind of like, I, I don't want to say skill shots, but they're kind of skill shots in a way, um, where it's, you have to take into account where the enemies are. So like, there's one skill that I have, which is just a straight, a straight line, but it passes through enemies. So obviously you're going to want to hit as many enemies as possible to kind of counteract the cost. Yeah. Um, so it's more tactical. Psionics are very tactical. Um, their cost is pretty high, um, but they are damaging. Um, and the fact that anyone can use them, there's there's no restrictions on it. So so the so the idea of someone get someone gishing is is not going to be not going to be as out there as it might be in other games. No. Um, you you could be like an unarmed uh, unarmed uh, monk that like attacks like four times, um, and then oh you've got like triggered actions. Oh, this spell costs one, but I've also got an ability crystal which lets me use my triggered actions as a main action when casting spells. You attack a bunch of times and then cast spells, um, and it's like okay. You're doing the equivalent damage of somebody who's just a pure spellcaster at that point, um, but you're just kind of upfront damage. Um, anyone can use spells, basically. Um, there's no, yeah, there's no restrictions because um, yeah. I feel that that's kind of um, you know, BS in a way, um, and the fact that you can just stop being a melee guy and start casting as long as you have crystals also it, you have to actually collect for crystals you don't learn anything and i'm get, given that i'm get, i'm guessing i'm guessing that um that late, that in a later development of the game you plan on in, you plan on integrating that with say treasure tables or the like uh, very much so yes oh. random generation all the way it works for <laughs> anything as long as it's not at the table. Hey, as far as as far as I'm concerned, RN Jesus is a model is a model of equality. <laughs> RN Jesus is basically for second DM. Um, well, I one of the mantras we have here in the temple is that it doesn't it does not matter your age, race, occupation, gender, gender identity, what have you. The dice gods hate you. Yes, they hate everyone equally. Mm -hmm. And that is true equality. <laughs> but one of the, now one of the one of the things I find I find very interesting is the is the fact that now now spell spell points is which is what you essentially have when it comes to psionic use is mm -hmm. har, is hardly a, is hardly a new concept. But yeah. this mixture of of man of managing that pool. While ha while have while um having to um essentially gimp in, in order to at in order to attune spells to crystals, um what was the reasoning behind that behind that particular setup? Um, mostly to stop people from casting like tier six spells like three times around, mm -hmm. um because <laughs> that kind of goes back to a previous world where it's like how do you how do you stop the cast is just being OP and like for best and just everyone choosing them. Mm -hmm. um, because if you can cast like uh, like an area denial for, oh, an enemy walls through it, you just like melt. It's like, how do you put up, how do you like 
keep up with that if you're like a uh, like a melee. Mm -hmm. So um, having resource management um, is kind of a big thing. Um, it, it's mostly, uh, and you'll you'll understand, taken from Path of Exile mm -hmm. uh, with like auras um, and. If, if you want to do a certain thing, pay the cost. Um, and like before, it's not so bad in the beginning um, because like uh, here's zero spells, basically your D&D your cantrips. They don't, they cost a bit, but they don't reserve any mana. You just have them. Um, where like tier one, it reserves one mana. Um, tier two, two mana, etc up until tier six, but players don't have that much mana, even at tier, like uh, character tier five. Um, so yeah, you could use that one tier six spell and reserve like half your mana. Um, and then you can use it like once around, or you could use a bunch of like tier twos. Um, but if you know you're up against a big boss that's weak to, say, a, a big-ass lightning spell, you're going to use that lightning spell. Because that's just planning. Like, that's just common sense. Like, even, like, if your character knows it, yeah, they're going to use it. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, one, question yeah. That, one question that I do have on future developments with, with um, psionics is... Sure. Do you have do you have and do you have any plan to in to introduce spell customization a, a la um met a la meta magic or overcasting or whatnot? Uh, yeah. So, uh, yes, <laughs> it's easy. Uh, pretty much answer to that. Um, I I love kind of making my own spells. Um, and with the tag system five five put in and I've kind of been refining over uh past like month or two. I, I feel like that would be a, a pretty easy thing to really add. Um before like in one of my older games I had custom spells but it was not it it, it worked but it wasn't it didn't feel great because you had to spend like half an hour of out for it it wasn't great. Uh, but I've been kind of refining that, and yeah, with a tag system, it should work a lot better. Um, but yeah, um, d define like specific overcasting. Um, the in sim in simplest ter in simplest terms, it's pay it's paying e it's paying extra to get a to get a boosted effect. Um, ah. Um. So, um, yes, I I will probably put that in, um, but it won't be for damage. It'll be for like area or uh, like freeze duration or something like that. Yeah, um, in some like a few a few exa a few examples from other games I I can think of when it comes to this sort of thing. Obviously, there's the whole, there's the whole thing with meta magic in D and D mm -hmm. and Pathfinder, but um, there's overbleed in in say. Um, and say and say um, dark heresy, for instance. Um, there's the there's been the raise system in um, Legend of the Five Rings, and 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 other set and other particular uh, setups. And of course, there's th there's stuff like kicker and in and in twine and the and the like in say Magic the Gathering. No, you can. Or, yeah. You're, you're essentially you're essentially paying more to to do more um yeah um so basically just add an effect stuff um yeah. uh yes uh, I'll, I'll probably put that in as i said it probably, it won't be like ever for damage mm -hmm. because you won't need more damage if you're if you're able to do that you won't need damage is that's not the limiting factor there um it's like oh, it's an attack uh, spell for like hits multiple enemies, make it more hit more enemies, or um, make it do an effect afterwards. Because oh, if a spell hits, oh well, you can apply on hit effects then with it. Um, that sort of stuff. 
Now, when it comes to rec when it comes to recovering FP, how how um how do you have that set up? Are you are you doing it in are you doing it as as the old eight hour rest or do you, or is it something that's recovered a bit more quickly? Um, so there's no. Uh, from what I remember, I haven't <laughs> I haven't actually touched it in in a while, but um, and my memory is as I said just really bad. Uh, there's a surprisingly there's a lot of stuff in the book, but um, most of it, um, I believe it's recovered during rest, um, but it doesn't have to be eight hour rest. Um, so you, you recover a quarter of your max for every two hours you rest. Um, so you can break up your eight hours into like six hours and you get obviously three quarters back. Mm -hmm. Um, there's also, uh, mana potions, um, uh, every, every character basically starts with two uh, refillable potions that refill when you enter a town, which <laughs> is very gamey, but um, I always hate it when you're like going out and about in like, say, Pathfinder, and it's like, oh, I need, I need a potion. I, I don't have one. Um, and it's like, oh, I go into a town. This, this, uh, you've left all your stuff at a base or whatever. I need a potion. Well, you, you've got one now. So it's, um, it, it stops that sort of stuff happening pretty much. Um, but you can drink your potion, um, and you get mana back essentially. Um, I think there's, other, there's abilities which let you, regen mana uh if there isn't i probably will put some in there mm. just for like um people for want to kind of go that route of kind of like like machine gun small spells um but in general it's recovery through rest um same with health it's it works the same as health mm -hmm. and with the big re the big reason that i ask that kind of thing is um you know what is sometimes whenever there's a limited resource there's the ten there's a tendency to to create the rainy day paradox yeah. you know say you know save because some some people myself included will hold on to that one posh one potion for when they think they're really gonna need it and then they never do <laughs> yeah or the, um or no I, I totally get that that's um the whole, I can't really, use uh, one of my ninety-nine mega mega elixirs. What if I need it for later? <laughs> yeah, I. Uh, that is a big kind of thing. I I, I would anticipate. Mm -hmm. Um. I'm I'm not entirely sure if I want kind of like regeneration. Um, because uh, in one of my again in in one of my older games, I had regeneration per turn. Um. And it was just another thing to keep track of. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to kind of limit the number of things that the players have to, like, worry about during their turn. Because let, let's be honest, like, nobody does anything when it's not their turn. <laughs> like, they're, they're focused on, like, the game itself or, like, uh, maybe chatting someone else or getting food. No, not everybody might use mana. Um, and as certain attacks or spells... Which reduce your, which can reduce your mana, um, and that having to Like put it back up once it's down. It's again just another thing to focus on, um, and there's only so much. Uh, what's the word for it? Um, kind of mental endurance that a player can take, mm. in my opinion. Um, 
but it is certainly a um an issue that can arise i i, I agree with you with that um yeah i i did kind of want to play around with the idea of just getting your mana back at the end of a fight um kind of like how you do with uh certain effects uh at the end of like an encounter or a scene um that might be one thing to kind of do if um if i've been kind of pushing more towards you just get everything back other than health because health is actually important yeah um yeah <laughs> that was a bit long-winded but yeah and one thing one thing that one thing that I'm cu one thing that I'm curious about is, and this is some this is something that I've that I've talked with a few other people about is the is the difference between ho between horizontal and ver and vertical advancement. Now, mm -hmm. as I understand it, even though you're calling them tiers, you do kind of have a level system. Um. Within that within that set within that um setup, is it a, is it a case where you you get a you get a level then you get a num you get a number of points you can spend on you can spend on just about anything uh no so it works like numenera you uh gain a num uh, uh an amount of renown and you spend that renown on benefits um and once you've got a certain amount of benefits you go up a tier mm -hmm. um and those benefits can be a uh, health increase uh, well, initially, in right currently in the book, it's uh, health and FP. But I'm probably going to split it up for like if people really want to go casters, uh, they can. Um, they can get FP instead of health for whatever reason they want to do. Um, but if you get a certain amount or all of them, etc., um, you go up a tier. So health or FP or uh, you get a new. Um, you, so you don't learn like kind of skills you you can use any skill um you'll just not be great at it um but one of the benefits is that you get um like kind of proficient in a skill that you don't already own mm -hmm. um so it goes from nothing proficient and specialized specialization is super hard to get um that takes actual like rp to kind of get that um and you also get kind of some knowledge as well. Um, but that's done through kind of a, a separate system. Um, but you get that at increasing tier as well. Um, uh, I believe you get some other stuff as well. Uh, I'll have to check it later. But you, you get like a certain number and you go up a tier. Mm -hmm. um, but you can choose how you want to get those things. Um, so you get health first, or if you're in a pickle, you could get uh, like your skill increase. Uh, oh, it was a, 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 a tribute increases basically, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it, that's pretty much how the tiering system works. Um, there might be a bit of a kind of a confusion on calling them tiers, but they're technically levels. Um, so that might be something to address later on. But yeah, that's essentially how it is. Um, I don't know if I explained it well enough. <laughs> Sorry. Um, now, one speak since you mentioned turns, that brings up an interesting, th an interesting setup that you have regarding turn order. In that, instead, instead of instead of doing the everybody rolls initiative setup, mm -hmm. you have a um, you have a pool of points that's distributed amongst the party. What yeah. prompted that particular idea? Um, rolling, rolling is boring. Um, the, yeah, for me, <laughs> anyway, um, I, I, I've, I've always kind of been looking for something different, um, for the initiative. Um, I initially tried having everybody goes at the same time, like, as in actually goes at the same time instead of like one side and then the other or like um kind of like somebody chooses who to go in it that sort of thing 
Um, that worked um, for a time, and then it kind of gets bogged down when you have to ha do like fifteen different things, and then make sure for like you're not in a an area or yeah. <laughs> um, but for for this, I wanted to encourage teamwork. Um, like if you're not working as a team and you're not don't have a plan of what you're going up against you'll probably die um so yeah I, I wanted people to work together for once instead of just rolling and going haha i got natural 20 i go first or um oh i got a one um and then you just kind of get shredded by like four other monsters that come before you <laughs> Um, and it's like, okay, so say you have like 20 points and there's like three players. You could, if you know somebody, uh, has a weapon that's like super effective against a certain monster, mm -hmm. you just have them go first and like shred the monster down. Um, or like, oh, you have somebody that's kind of like, you've been ambushed and they're like in between a couple of monsters and it you know that they don't have a lot of health. You could have them go for amounts of people and like one person because they still get an equivalent amount. Um, yeah. <laughs> and is it is it something that is it something that could mid cut mid cut? Combat resh be reshuffled as as um, situation changes in a given combat. Uh, yes. So, for instance, if the party moves into um, so if there, if there's a scene and there's an encounter in that scene, um, their initiative is still technically at like what they have if their fight ends. Mm -hmm. um, that's just due to like if another encounter happens um so if they go into like a new area or something that could get rejiggled around mm -hmm. um especially if like there's a bunch of bunch of monsters that come in um where they go on like the hierarchy can change um you could also change your own initiative as a player um so like this kind of goes slightly back to like how do you get MP ba uh, FP back, mm -hmm. um, but you can kind of take a breather um, and at, at times shuffle your initiative around and you get FP back as well. Um, so you don't have to just, you know, not cast again, um, but also it gives you time to reassess and like, okay, I want to go after another player. Okay, well, you can't do anything this turn, but you will go after them next turn. Um, it's like readying your entire turn for a certain slot. Um, so it's put on for players if they want to shuffle around at a again at an opportunity cost because they can't do anything until their turn comes around again. Mm -hmm. um, but. It kind of works the same if there's two encounters um, in like two different rooms, for example. If one player goes into another room, they're counted in that second fight. Um, their initiative like drops to the bottom um, and they can't do anything until their next turn. So um, I, I feel for it's rather tactical in a sense. Um, obviously, if people want to play it where it's just, oh, you just roll for initiative. 
that's fine. <laughs> they can play it however they want. I don't mind. Um, but for people looking for more of a, um, I don't want to say team bonding because it might lead to some arguments. Um, but that's certainly one way um, they can do it by just spending the pools of points. Um, obviously, super fast characters will kind of naturally go like first mm -hmm. um, if you put all your points into like your like speed. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, they're gonna kind of have more of a baseline. Um, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can I can see I can see that. And you even if the, and if they of course if they really want if they you really really want to go first, they'd probably. Um, that ba that baseline pro that baseline probably is a determining factor in how much and how much of these initiative tokens that they would need in order to go first. So it'd be easier. Yes, for them. Uh, it'd be less demanding yeah. for them to do so for them to do so versus if the um versus if the chonky guy wants to do it. Yeah, I was I was gonna uh, I was gonna say that pretty much. Um, yeah, having having a good speed is beneficial for that. Mm -hmm. Um. You don't have to like. You can just let other people have more points. Yeah. Um. So, in in some ways, like people kind of like you being fast because they get more initiative. Mm -hmm. Now, through play testing. I've done a few playtests here and there. Um, playtests are hard to get. Um, mostly um, because I'm in England um, and most of the people I know are from America mm -hmm. or Australia. Or uh, Time zones are, are bad. I don't like them. Um, Reaching to the choir there. And... And... Um, it's been pretty hard to find like at least one more to start an another playtest because mm. um, I want to do a proper playtest campaign rather than one shots. Um, it, le it lets me kind of tweak and then see, tweak and then see, you know, mm -hmm. um, rather than just getting like one batch of feedback and get like you know a month's worth. But it has been through a bunch of playtests already, mm. um, varying results. Uh, I've done a bunch of like combat only. Um, the RP side, uh, specifically, like with factions and stuff, hasn't been done as much, um, only because that's more of a kind of player by player basis, um, and not. And I kind of I understand not everybody's a like a super strong role player, um, but at some point there are mechanics to kind of mitigate that. 
so they don't have to you know do voices and costumes and whatnot and you know um n- not everybody's um like critical role basically um no in fr- in that'd fact, be fun at, at my old at my old um at my old lgs they were kind enough to to um to go through to go with the request that I ha- that I had to put up a Wayne's World style sign on, on the wall that said absolutely no Matt Mercer, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like the whole absolutely no Stairway to Heaven. Oh, uh, yeah. Because <laughs> I uh, I would do yeah. I would do um guest GM roles for for them from time from time to time, just running one shots, and um yeah. inevitably somebody would bring him up. And oh um, yeah, yeah, that's uh... I. I just got sick of it, and I and I um I jokingly said I sh- I swear we need to have a Wayne's World so- sign that just says absolutely none none of that, just like we just like just like certain places have absolutely no piano man or absolutely no stairway to heaven. And- yeah, I I found that um once like like new people who get into it watch like Critical Role, and they're like, why isn't everything like this? Yeah. Why isn't everyone doing goofy voices and like being <laughs> Literally voice actors. I got nothing against Critical Role. I've got nothing against Mercer and yeah. all that, but I do. I am of the opinion that it's not that it's not a very good introduction to the way role playing actually works. Yeah, it, it's put a um, not a stereotype. Um, it's kind of put an image um, of how D and D's or role playing supposed to be played. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no, nothing against them. I, I think. Uh, great show um it's just i would like a lot less people to be like why aren't you doing goofy voices yeah especially especially since it's a lot it's a lot easy it's a lot easier to get away with goofy voices when you have a table full of voice actors just yeah 100 (laughs) percent um but but as as for playtesting uh yeah i've done it a bunch of times um the last the last one i did was specifically combat um in one versus one like party versus one enemy and party versus a bunch of enemies um the main thing was was obviously balance balancing was a um a big thing because nobody played before uh, my game so nobody really knew kind of what was like good for like how they wanted to play um but from for, for stuff i got from it was that like Having to tactically use different elements um, was fun, um, and that it flowed really well once people got to got with it because it's like uh, it it was like super fast turns, mm-hmm. um, and I wanted to keep. I like turn orders being fast and fluid. Um, there's nothing worse than like somebody taking like ten fifteen minutes for their turn and not knowing what to do, um, and I, I think that kind of goes back into what you said with like the. Um, uh, analysis paralysis. Um, or in in some cases, being paranoid that the one choice that you make is going to bite you in the ass three rounds later. Yeah, yeah, that that that's a big thing that I've had before. Mm-hmm. Um, and for for most of the stuff, like I, I mentioned, like just having limits on like the amount of uh, ability crystals that you can have at once um it kind of l- like makes it real fast because you don't like for example pathfinder you can have like 10 feet and it's like okay if half of them are like actual damaging abilities you don't it takes time to read and know what to use against what enemies and you know oh, am i too close to this enemy to really you know be able to use this without dying um, but like, if you've only got three or like four, then, you know, it, it's obviously not as fast, like literally, but, uh, same with crystal, like spell crystals, mm-hmm. like you just don't have as many, but you can swap them out whenever you really, whenever you want. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll certainly be keeping a close eye on how, on how shifting tides develops as the, as we get closer and closer to the end of the year. Um, but with with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for braving the hell of time zones and com- and coming all the way up to my te- to my temple to sh- to share the ins- share in the insanity that comes around. 
with shifting tides. Sorry, had something in my throat. Or 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 just to just to do a glorified shit post, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Oh, I wish I had something right now then. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> well, just uh, we'll just say we'll just say you did after the fact. Uh, Perfect. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.